Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to, what is it again? Uh, scared. Scared to death. Scared to death. Scared to death. <laughs> Creeps, Beavers, Roberts, and Annabelle. Oh my God. That would be so scary to me if all of a sudden you were like, um, and I'm like, oh my God, he's had a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dan. You're Lindsay. I am. Perfect. Um, two little quick announcements and then we are into the stories. Uh, fun new merch in the Bad Magic Store this week. This one is for all you creeps and peepers who just can't wait for Halloween. The ones who would elect to celebrate it year-round or do. The Is It Halloween Yet tee now available. The three vintage-style Halloween masks kind of look like the old generic plastic ones. I remember oh, those yeah. as a kid mm -hmm. with a little... Uh, tiny little uh, elastic strap around the back. Yeah, you were always afraid it was going to like snap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it was so flimsy, it would break sometimes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, and, and it's uh, in a classic faded black, orange, and green color scheme with those masks. Available cool. on vintage cream, vintage cream sickle orange tees. Uh, head on over to badmagicmerch.com to check it all out. I like it. I like it. That made me think I saw on like Instagram or TikTok or something, mm -hmm. this funny meme of somebody in a like definitely development neighborhood with an HOA with like a 15 foot giant skeleton. And it was oh, like, wow. but the caption was something like me pretending like I'm not breaking the HOA laws like all year long. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know those people. Can I do my announcements? Yeah, let's do it. Great. So just as a reminder, our charity this month is Big Table, which you've already heard us talk about, but we finally have our totals. We will be donating $13,986 to Big Table with another $1,554 headed towards the scholarship fund. If you want to learn more about Big Table, you can go to big-table.com. Mm -hmm. That's it. Easy That's peasy. It. Let's get to the hose. <laughs> what, uh, what fan submitted horror uh, do you have for the creeps and peepers this week? Very unintentionally, I have thematic stories, okay. both involving little boys oh. or not. All right. That's it. That's all I'm going to tell you. All right. Just a little, tiny little tease for those stories. Uh, for my first story, I have some alleged journal entries from a little mining town in Colorado called Cripple Creek. Cripple Creek. From 1892. Probably doesn't sound too terrifying, but just imagine, you know, dealing with, uh, I'll keep it somewhat vague, but some of the paranormal horror that people deal with in the modern world, but then they can actually like leave their house and go mm. to an in-laws or they can call over a priest or an exorcist, a spiritualist, somebody, shaman to come deal with things. Well, imagine dealing with some of the worst of those same things, but having no one to help. Okay. And then for the next story, I'll share some history and then a smattering of recent paranormal sightings from England's very historic Colchester Castle. Colchester. I bet it's written in a weird way that doesn't look like Colchester. You know what? I expected that. And uh, the pronunciation, I was like, wait, are you sure? This is actually pronounced like it's spelled. Bless you. Thank you. Um, it's C-O-L and then just Chester. And, and it was so, so just straightforward on the money. I'm like, am I being tricked? <laughs> but, Fair uh, enough. Yeah. I watched a couple of videos where, you know, people Col over in the UK. Colchester. Colchester. Yeah. Colchester or Colchester? Well, if I had an accent, maybe I'd say Colchester. But uh, Got it. Uh, but, oh, no. Cole, but Cole Chester. There you go. Did I get it? You got it. I got it. Man, you guys, Dan and I have been weirdly complaining about allergies. I know it's April and mm -hmm. where we are, it's still snowing, which is great. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it should be allergy season, but damn. Something. Something. Something's up. Okay. So uh, almost zero set up with this first story. Socks. Oh, that's right. These almost are very the socks. special socks. Check these out, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> they have eyes. <laughs> Somebody put a lot of work into these socks. Arms. And legs. I was convinced initially that somebody had made them, but then they had the little like tag on them. So mm. clearly not. So my leg is being eaten by a gator. So much creativity in the sock world. I know. It's so fun. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Uh, okay. Yeah. So almost zero set up with this first story. All right. Let's go, bro. Um, so this is what uh, somebody uh, posted. I've chosen to type out and post the following final entries from a journal of a relative of mine that I came to possess over a century ago. Uh, oh, the, the a journal, a relative of mine, 
big difference. Came to possess over a century ago. They're not a, they're not an immortal vampire or something. <laughs> Uh, whatever questions you might have, don't bother asking them of me. I don't know anything more than what I have shared here. Time now for the tale of evil unearthed. December 6th, 1892. Where to begin? I murdered my husband, Jonathan, last night. Oh, dear. I had to. And now I do not know the present location of his remains. To understand why I committed such an awful act that I have no doubt you find shocking and possibly unforgivable, I must explain all the events that led to how this came to transpire. I beg you to read this in its entirety. If you are reading this, I exist no longer. Additionally, you now find yourself in grave danger. If you are reading this in what was briefly our happy home, leave now. Finish this tragic story somewhere safe. The story of how I came to live here in this cabin alone, just outside Cripple Creek, Colorado, is one filled with sorrow. Jonathan and I were wed in Sullivan County, Missouri in 1875. We were only settled in that locality until autumn of 1878, when we gathered our few most necessary belongings and, in a covered wagon, set out with our little son Otis to follow my parents to the little burg of El Paso, Illinois, on the McLean County side, where they had preceded us the year before. My father had left his butcher's block behind in 1870 to try farming in Missouri, only to find he was never cut out to till the soil. Thoroughly discouraged and weary of the farming experiment, he left the little farm that had proved so disappointing, turning it over to Jonathan, my husband, to farm for another year. In that time, Jonathan also grew weary of farming, and his ability to work as a butcher alongside my father inspired us to leave Missouri for Illinois as well. How I wish we were in Illinois still. In McLean County, we spent nearly a dozen mostly good years. We had two more healthy children, both girls, Sadie and Emma. For the first many years in Illinois, I was content. My family was happy and healthy. My mother was near for advice, and my father was able to provide a good trade and a business education for my husband. We were not wealthy, but we also did not need for anything. Still, for my Jonathan, this was not enough. Every few months, it seemed, he would speak to someone who would be traveling through El Paso to seek their fortune in one of the many gold rushes out west. After a few years of this, Jonathan began to feel as though he was missing out on the chance to not just provide for us, but to make our family rich. He would hear of another gold strike and try and convince me to leave our life in Illinois behind. But due to my heartache at the thought of separating from my parents, he would abandon his dream. But then my father passed in the winter of 1889. His heart gave out, is what the doctor said. Jonathan was a capable butcher, but he never really cared for the work. And when a new butcher moved into town who did, money was soon in short supply. In the spring of 1890, my mother passed, pneumonia. And then further tragedy befell us. A terrible outbreak of flu burned through El Paso that summer, and my little Emma died from fever. I was heartbroken, both parents and my youngest child all dead within a year. Grief overcame Jonathan even more than it did me. A longing for life seemed to fade from his eyes. His spirit had left him. I worried he would do something foolish. He barely spoke. He seemed interested in nothing. And then a man, Alan Wilson, I think his name was, came into town talking of new riches being found in Colorado. More gold. Jonathan begged once again for our family to head west. When he spoke of Colorado, I could see a new spark in him again. He seemed renewed. With both my parents now gone, still grieving the loss of my little girl, Seeing less money come in every month and seeing my husband happy for the first time in months, I no longer had anything of substance to protest. Off west we went in the summer of 1891. We took our most important belongings, put them in our covered wagon once more, and made the short trip to Peoria, where we were able to connect with the Burlington Railroad. We took a series of trains all the way to Denver. Along the way, Jonathan became convinced that we needed to make our claim in Cripple Creek. We traveled there by wagon for two weeks after leaving the train behind, heading south. We arrived in Cripple Creek on June 10th. We stayed in a large canvas tent the rest of that summer while Jonathan built a small one-room log cabin for our family on our homestead and mining claim about a half mile from town. Our acreage is beautiful. The land is all beautiful here. I had never seen such mountains before. And the new town of Cripple Creek bristled with energy and hope for the future. Jonathan found the gold he dreamt of and more. Seeing him run back to the cabin, shrieking out with joy shortly after first working his claim is one of my favorite memories. We had moved past the grief and despair of the last years in Illinois and had begun an exciting new chapter in our lives. 
You could taste promise in the air. The sun felt brighter, the sky more blue. Providence abounded. The gold Jonathan found more than paid for all the food and supplies we needed for that first winter. A new school was opened in town for the children, and there they made wonderful friends. The cabin was small, but it was more than enough. Life felt magical. With the gold Jonathan continued to pull from the ground, the promise of a new home in the next year or two felt certain. Spring came early that next year, and with it, more gold. Some nuggets were the size of a walnut. We could not believe our good fortune. What had we done to be blessed with so much? That summer showered us with abundance as well, but then fall came, and with the changing of the season, complete devastation followed our early blessings. A wicked outbreak of flu hit Cripple Creek in October, and 30 local folk died, including eight of the children. Two of those eight were ours. Otis and Sadie now followed Emma out into the great beyond that awaits us all. All my babies were gone. How too I wish I would have died with them. Jonathan buried our last two children on our property a ways in front of the cabin, and when he dug their graves, he discovered that he was not the first to bury there in the soil. There were already the remains of others, where he had chosen to lay our last children to rest. Instead of gold, now Jonathan unearthed bones. So many bones. And when he carelessly tossed the old remains into a ravine to make room for our Otis and Sadie, I believe he awoke something, something he could not see, something I began to see that first night. I initially mistook this new darkness for grief. The pain over the death of my children led me to mistake what I now believe to be possession for mourning. I must stop writing for today. I cannot bear to record any more pain, and what's more, it's starting to get dark out. It is worse at night. I need to prepare for what more may come. I hope I am able to finish my warning. December 7th, 1892. Last night was nothing short of terrible. Before I write of new horrors, I shall first tell you what became of my dear Jonathan. The night following digging the graves, I awoke to a cold breeze on my skin. The cabin door was open and the cool mountain night air chilled me nearly to the bone. Jonathan was not beside me. And with the moonlight streaming into the cabin, I could quickly ascertain that he was not in the cabin at all. I rose and waked and walked to the open door and gasped at what I saw. Jonathan had removed his long nightshirt and stood stark naked, facing away from the cabin, staring silently out into the darkness. When I called out to him, he did not respond in any way, as if he were still sleeping. But he was not asleep. He had been possessed by it, partially at least. I walked across our cold, small porch and placed my hand upon his shoulder. He turned and looked right at me, eyes open, and after his mouth formed an amused smile, he said, Death comes for us both, but what is worse than death comes first. What has been done cannot be undone. Jonathan, you frighten me, I screamed, and in an instant his eyes revealed my husband behind them again, and whatever he had been was no more. Jonathan now stood, naked and embarrassed, before the cabin he had built, greatly distressed at how he had arrived where he found himself. I walked him back to our bed, and we convinced ourselves that the terrible burden of burying our children led to a night terror that caused him to rise from his bed and walk, still in the throes of sleep, outside of our home. But then it happened again the very next night. Once more I awoke to the bite of the cold blowing into our bed through the open door. Once more my Jonathan was nowhere to be found inside the cabin. This time, I knew what I would find. I braced myself for strange words and stepped out into the night. Naked and as if in a trance, again he stood and stared off into the darkness. Jonathan? I quietly called out. Are you awake, my dear? As I expected, he did not respond. Jonathan? I called a little louder. You're scaring me, dear. Please come back inside. Bam! The cabin door slammed shut and I nearly died of fright. I moved towards the closed door and pulled upon the handle. It would not budge. How? There was no none inside to lock it, and yet still I found myself unable to enter. What has been done cannot be undone. Again it was Jonathan's mouth speaking, but not his voice, saying the same frightful words he had said before. Before death comes terror, the worst comes first. I screamed upon hearing those words. And then again, like the previous night, he reclaimed himself somehow and had no recollection of how he had arrived outside or what he had said. He moved past me and easily opened the door that had been locked but a moment before. Before I could gather myself to speak with him, he was back in our bed, fast asleep. I slept no more that night. 
I was far too worried about the man beside me, a man who could now turn from loving husband to threatening stranger in an instant. The next day, I wanted to walk into town, talk to our pastor about it all. Our home needed a blessing. But an early storm quickly became a blizzard. The snow fell too fast and became too deep for me to risk the journey alone. And there was the matter of Jonathan having no interest in accompanying me. He had never been the most religious man, but he would always attend church with me and the children whenever asked. He never once had a bad thing to say about church or God. But now when asked if he would help me into town, he told me there was no reason to do something so foolish. When I begged, he spat at me in a way that made me recoil. He had never spoken to me like that before, saying, God is for the weak. There will never be God in this house again. The way he stared when he spoke those hateful words sent chills down into my spine. His eyes were not his own, and for the first time in my life, he truly scared me to my core. That was a long, dreadful day in the cabin. At one point, a few hours before nightfall, Jonathan, who had not eaten or spoken a word to me all day other than what I just told you, abruptly stood up, put on his boots and heavy coat, grabbed an axe, and left the cabin. I still do not know where he went or what he did. When he came back an hour or so later, his hands were covered in dried blood. There was blood on the axe, on his coat. Worst of all, there was blood on his face, especially around his mouth. He had been eating something. What, I will never know. He never told me, and I was far too frightened to ask. When he returned, he sat facing me, saying nothing, but baring his teeth slightly, in what one could almost describe as an impish grin. Perhaps snarl would be more appropriate. It was how a dog often looks before it bites. I don't know how long this went on. It felt like hours. Finally, he rose to go to the outhouse, and when he did, I stood up and grabbed a large knife from the kitchen, placing it underneath my pillow. After he returned, I too now walked to the outhouse, careful to avoid getting too close to the man who looked like my husband, but acted more like a demon. As I walked the short distance between the cabin and the outhouse, my flesh erupted into goosebumps. I felt eyes watching me from somewhere near the children's graves. I should have wanted to weep to grieve for my precious babies, but instead all I felt was terror. Something was out there in the darkness near them, and it was watching me, and I knew it was connected to the new change in my husband. I didn't stay a moment in the outhouse longer than I needed to and quickly walked back to the cabin. Whatever was out there was still out there. I would have ran had I not been running towards another monster, Jonathan, or what Jonathan had somehow become. When I entered the cabin, Jonathan was in his bed, his hands and face still bloody. He laid on his back and stared up towards the ceiling. His eyes were open, yet he seemed not to see me. His mind, his very soul, I feared, was somewhere else. I wanted to pound upon his chest, beg him to stop, beg whatever had taken him to return him to me, but I knew it would be of no use. I don't know where he went, but Jonathan was gone. Some devil, maybe Satan himself, had taken him. I lay down quietly into bed and grabbed the knife I had hidden. I moved it down to my side and I waited. I was tempted to use the knife on myself to avoid what I feared was coming. And it did come. Some time later that night, I truly do not know when, the real horror began. Jonathan shot up in bed, crying out, The terror is here! Tonight we taste hell! He turned his head like a snake while his body remained still to scream that final part. And then the rest of his body spun around to the point where his face now did. And he lunged atop me as I shoved the knife up into his belly. He did not fight to avoid the blade. Rather, he twisted himself back and forth as if to make the wound larger. He stared into my eyes and smiled as he did so. He grabbed my wrist with both hands, moved the knife up towards his own chest now, all while never breaking his stare with me. Before death comes terror, he sneered. His final words. He died with that horrible grin on his face, his bloody body collapsing atop my own. I thought I were to go mad that night. Covered in his blood, I screamed until my throat was raw and my voice was hoarse. When I finally stopped, I noticed how quiet it was outside the cabin eerily quiet. All the familiar night sounds I'd grown accustomed to were gone. Outside one of our two little windows, I could sense that thing from before, from the darkness around my children's graves. It was watching me. It was enjoying my pain. I now crawled towards and then sat in the corner furthest from the windows, still holding my knife, and I waited for morning. At some point before dawn, I fell asleep, and when I awoke, I screamed again. My husband's body had moved in the night. What abomination was I now witnessing? 
Jonathan was sitting in the corner opposite me, mimicking the position in which I sat, his eyes open as if staring at me, the horrible smile still on his face. It took me a long while to get up and start to move around the cabin. I wanted to leave, but it had snowed again during the night. It would be hard now to make it even to the outhouse. After making sure my husband's body had not somehow come back to life, I gathered the courage to grab it and drag it from the corner to the front door. I thought for certain he would awaken and carve me to pieces. I opened the door, got it outside, set a block of firewood in the door frame so it could not close and dragged him to the edge of the little porch. I pushed him up against a pile of snow and retreated back into the cabin. That was when I started to write all of this in my journal. I want the world know, to know what happened here. Something here is rotten, evil, and I hope someone knows how to send it back to hell or wherever else it came from. That day I stayed inside the cabin. I did not leave for any reason, not even to try to use the outhouse. I needed to get more firewood to boil new water, but instead I just drank from what little remained. That night, terrible shadows raced past the windows in the darkness. Something banged on the door here and there throughout the night. I heard strange, awful cries and what sounded like whispering. I kept waiting for something to force its way inside. I barely slept if I slept at all. It seemed like morning would never come. When it did, desperate for firewood that, fo that following morning, I dared to open the door and again I screamed. My husband's body was gone. Something had taken it. Or... He had walked away. There were no obvious marks of it being dragged, only footsteps in the snow. Before death comes terror, I now heard my dead husband impossibly yell, and when I spotted the source of the sound, his corpse was standing atop where our children's graves would be, and he was not alone. Some other man-shaped figure, something like a man, but not a man, a kind of living shadow stood beside him. They both stared at me, and then my dead husband began to move towards me, and this other thing, it moved with him, mirroring his movements. I started to faint. It was all too much. I barely got myself back inside and locked the door before they reached the cabin. I slid to the floor and against the door as they began to pound upon it. I felt certain that they would break through if they wanted to, but it must have been more fun to frighten me this way. Finally, it stopped. After it did not start again for the next hour or so, I began to write this entry. If I am unable to write any more, please do not let my death, our death, be in vain. I believe that when Do Jonathan dug up those bones and tossed them into the ravine, he awoke something, he angered something, and it is pure evil. If I cannot escape it and find a way to put it back to rest, I hope that whoever reads this can. December 8th, 1892. This entry is only one sentence long. What has been done cannot be undone. There's blood on the page. December 9, 1892. Another short entry. Before death comes terror. I just want to die now, but it won't let me. More blood. December 10, 1892. The final entry. There are monsters beneath us that make the worst pain of this world look like a gift. I have tasted hell, and it is worse than I ever thought possible. If you find my heart still beating when you find this journal, if you have even an ounce of compassion for fellow human suffering, slit my throat and let it be over. More blood, and then at the bottom of the page, the worst comes first, the worst comes first, the worst comes. I can feel it now. It's inside of me. What new pain is this? And that is supposedly how the journal ended. The person who posted this all ended their post with, I burned the journal after transcribing these final entries, and I will never publicly give away the location of where the old cabin it was once found in once stood. I came across it in a collection of my great-great-great-uncle's chest. He died many, many years ago before his chest made it to me through a series of inheritances. He said to have gone mad and died shortly after taking a trip to Cripple Creek to visit the property of a cousin who died in some terrible tragedy. I hope whatever horror he found there died with him, but I doubt it. I contacted several religious leaders and spiritualists, shared this story with them, gave them the location of the former cabin, now a vacant lot. It's on them now to try and close whatever door Jonathan opened. Damn! That's a great story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah creepy one. Yeah. And just like, um, I mean, quite frankly, I, I realize it, obviously it was set so long ago, but like, yeah. I feel like, do you remember that story we had in Montana that took place during yes. the, the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Like a couple went out there. Mm -hmm. just Two like, women went up, went out there and uh, yeah, they were for some kind of vacation. Yeah. I think, I think it was, I, I'm almost certain it was like pandemic and what else could you do so you could go like that sounds right right and it was yeah, just yeah, like yeah. An, uh, a safe way 
a, a, like a, a physically safe way to kind of break up your routine. I think maybe they were like keyboard warriors, like they were able to, or yeah, they could like keyboard keyboard nomads, whatever they call it. <laughs> yeah, 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 they yeah, could yeah. Work from remote. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I was making that connection in my brain. Cause it's like, yeah, this is not a story that exists only in this space. Like right. this could, could it happen. Could be modern too. Could, yep, yep. Like I think about like our friend Darcy. Oh my God, our friend Darcy. She, mm-hmm. she, went, on, she went on a retreat down to like the Tetons. Yep, yep. Just she, a little alone time, you know, yep. like a kind of like a kind of like a little spiritual trip, you know, yep, like yep. reset. She needed it. She's been through a lot lately. Yeah, yeah. and then she, she took, had this, her dog took her dog. Took her dog. Just her and the dog. They had this great trip, and then crazy like late winter blizzard almost trapped her there. Yeah. Took yeah. her 12 hours to drive home. It should not take that long. Should have been like five, six hours, six mm-hmm. hours or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, doubled it. Maybe even seven, but like, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It, uh, 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 old cabins. Mm-hmm. I am. I wish that there was a way to follow up with whomever. Like the modern person who well, shared Well, whomever, this? whoever, uh, whomever they shared it with, like religious leaders. Like, oh. like, did they go and cleanse the land? Is the land okay? Like, what mm-hmm. did anyone ever think to try and go to the ravine and retrieve the bones? Or like, yeah. I don't know. You would have to bless the land and also the ravine. And uh, yeah, complicated. Uh huh. <sighs> yeah. yeah. What the fuck did they wake up? I don't know. But also, it you know lends itself to all the times that we're like, oh, you know, and this house was built on an ancient burial ground it's like don't fuck with buried bodies yeah bones like just stop just yeah. let it be let it lie because you don't know Oof. who they buried there mm-hmm. yeah it's, yeah Ugh. Nope, 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 a couple nope, pictures nope. this first one is cripple cripple creek's historic cripple main street today it's had a resurgence the last couple of decades because oh of a, my god it's so cute yeah they legalized gambling a couple of decades back you know just in the town yeah and it gave it like new life and it Cute. completely revitalized this little dying, you know, what was basically a ghost town before that. So charming. Uh, here's the same street back in 1892, right when the boom, like a year or so in. Whoa. <laughs> same mountain behind it, but yeah. Dang. How far outside of Denver is it? Do you know? Uh, how far? It's south. Oh my gosh. How many? You're good with geography. So I was just hoping you might I can have picture, a general idea. I, I can picture my brain in the map. I want to say like hour and a half to two hours south of Denver. Okay. Yeah. So it could be like a cute little getaway. Totally. Absolutely. Adorable. And then uh, this next one, little mining cabin outside of Cripple Creek from sometime in the 1890s. So around the time of this story, this was also a little, so that's like, to me, it's like they had some version of that cabin. Yep. And you can see the little covered porch mm-hmm. in the front, one of the tiny little windows in the back, but it's like, you know, these these cabins were one room, kitchen, bedroom, everything but the bathroom, which would be an outhouse at that time, is all in this one little tiny room. This uh, That photograph makes me think of Riggins, just as you're mm-hmm. driving from mm-hmm. Whitebird down to Riggins and you're driving along- uh, Salmon is, River? Yeah, the Salmon River. Yeah. You can just see some old- the Old homesteads? Yeah. And I yeah. mean, I don't think, for the most part, no one's using them for any reason, but you no. know, it's just it, like having a physical- yeah. Uh, like not just a picture, but having it seen it physically in person, like, oh yeah, I've really, yeah. like it, it makes the connection so much more yeah, they would, understandable. They would mine into the dig, you know, little, have little claims, dig into the side of the mountain and also yeah. do uh dre well, more modern times dredge mining. It's like when you mine the riverbed. Yeah. I think they might've called it dredge back then, or maybe they called it placer, like P-L-A-C-E-R mining. But mm. that's like, like the, the uh, classic, like um, the most rudimentary version is just like a classic gold pan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're just like grabbing that uh, sediment on the bottom of the river and sifting it around, and you it's know, like what you can do with kids if you go to an old gold mine yeah, now. Yeah, right? They're like, we can we can pan for gold. Yeah, and that's when they would find, you know, like the nuggets would be in the water, and then you know they'd have to work harder to get down into like the mm-hmm. they'd find veins of gold and quartz and stuff, and it was a lot more complicated. But like, what a crazy thing! Where one time when they first started mining this stuff, there would just be big ass nuggets just on the creek bed or on the river bed. And we assigned it so much value and so much power. Mm-hmm. We were yeah. just talking to somebody in our building yesterday oh, about yeah. like uh-huh. how gold, diamonds, like we've just decided that it's worth all this. I know it's funny how uh, arbitrary and subjective it all, or like, you know, maybe not subjective, but arbitrary it is where, you know, when people complain, I've heard like my whole life, uh, certain people complain about like the the lack of the gold standard and, you know, how is the uh, money's not worth anything because it's no longer attached to gold. And my counter argument is like, Gold is not inherently valuable. It's just a random rock. It's a mineral that we chose at some point in our history to decide that's worth something. Right. Well, because it but, wasn't- but it's, Inherently, in, it's not worth any more than a piece of gravel. Right. I think just right because it isn't in abundance. Right. It's a limited resource. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it that way, so is paper. 
Yep. Everything and is limited. So is water. And we like, look yeah. at what is happening in the world right now. It's just funny water. how much society is just, you know, this, we just make almost all of it up. I know it's nonsense. <laughs> I did make a, like on that, I did make it, I don't know, I guess like an interesting note of just like the monster of more, even then, like he just, it just wasn't enough. Like some people just can't be content. And I think like not to get, and I get it. I get it, but not yeah. to get like philosophical, but I feel like we do talk about that more now in yeah. modern times, like, you know, uh, fame and fortune you can have it all and yeah. social media changed it and everybody wants more and no one's content it's like oh no there's always been a contingency of those people totally, our, our entire totally. existence and sometimes it works out yep. where then it somebody is able to bring their family up yeah. and give them better opportunities etc cetera, etc cetera. but more often than not it just is something that itself possesses you and you just cannot move past it's like sometimes yeah. enough is enough can you pay your bills are you mm -hmm. happy like do you really totally. need more yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's tough. But yeah, what a what a great story. So sad that they lost their children. Yeah, there was so much tragedy before the paranormal stuff, which was just a sad sign of the times. Yes. Yes. No yep. medicine. Yeah. I yep. mean, they just didn't know what was coming for them. And that's another thing. As limited as medical stuff was back then, it was more limited in a little like gold strike boom town. Oh my gosh. Where there was, I mean, it, they were pretty lawless, you know, in yeah. ways. And it's like, they may have a doctor, they may not. Well, then they were all Not like- that they had real doctors back then, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and then they were all living on top of each other just because, you know, the gold tends to be concentrated in one sort of area. So as yeah. soon as one person gets sick, it's just like- Poof, Oh, yeah. Takes out mm -hmm. the whole town. I mean, just yeah. fascinating. But what a great story. I'm, oh, okay. I love that you journal liked it. and- mm -hmm. Yeah. Different, different setting, a little different. Yeah. Yeah. It was just really easy to place myself there and okay. really like be invested in, of course, I didn't write down her name, Jonathan's wife. Oh, Jonathan's wife. Oh my I gosh. I tell you, their and, kids and I'm are Otis her name and Sadie now too. and Emma. I know. Yeah. Jonathan and the wife. Jonathan. You know what? I don't know that she ever says her name. Okay. okay. Oh, because it's, it's from her perspective. Right. But you would think that the person who transcribed oh, yeah. it, that well, they or, would know. Or maybe they didn't want to share. Yeah, they, they didn't share her name, actually. So, you know, like everybody else. Bum, uh, bum, bum. Yep, yep. What okay. a twist. What a twist. <laughs> also, just for the record, Cripple Creek is about 95 miles outside of Denver for our Denver folks. Oh, okay, so I was right. About an hour and a half, two hours. It's annoying how well you understand geography. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's weird. I was pulling up the image in my brain of like the map I looked at uh -huh. and seeing the route. but I couldn't The Rand McNally map in well, your brain? Yeah, but I couldn't see the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't even know that I could read a map, quite frankly. <laughs> I I grew up in the age and era of yeah. like, you know, map quest and oh, yeah. GPS. <laughs> I didn't have to read a map. You ready to head to uh, an older place than what we just talked about, but talk about some more recent paranormal encounters? Colchester. 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 Okay, now for a mix of history and ghost stories. And quite a bit of setup here. Okie dokie. It's, it's interesting history, though. Uh, Colchester believed to quite possibly be the oldest proper city in all of Great Britain. Colchester was conquered by the Roman Emperor Claudius nearly 2,000 years ago. Claudius sent soldiers into Colchester when it was known as Camelodunum, a Celtic stronghold and then capital of Roman Britain. What's it called? Uh, it's Camelodunum. Cam Camelodunum. The emperor's army built a fortress on the highest ground where the city center is now located. By 49 CE, almost two full millennia ago, the fortress was a civilian settlement named Colonia Claudia, and it became the first capital of the Roman province of Britannia. It feels like it was named after somebody's wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the dude, the Emperor Claudius, mm -hmm, but it sounds like Claudia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Temple of Claudius was built in 54 CE after the emperor was deified after his death, and the ancient foundations of the Temple of Claudius would become the site of the future Colchester Castle over a thousand years later. Colchester was eventually briefly reconquered by Boudicca, queen of the Celts. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, truly like a warrior queen. In 60 CE, Queen Boudicca rebelled against the Romans. Temple of Claudius was burned. Roman defenders were killed. Sadly, the Romans would pretty quickly reclaim the city. They had a lot, lot, lot greater numbers. What? Uh, London would now become the Roman capital of the province, but still Colchester would grow to become the major city of around 30,000 by the 3rd century CE. Construction of Colchester Castle would begin 700 years later, starting in 1076, being completed in 1100. William the Conqueror ordered the construction of a stone castle along the, uh, along the strategic route between East Anglia, Eastern England, and London. Now the Normans built the castle over the ruins of the Roman temple. The base of the temple was incorporated into the foundations. The foundation of that temple and its vaults remain below the castle to this day, making the site much more historically significant. 
Also, speaking of significance, Colchester Castle was the largest castle ever built in England by the Normans, England's French invaders. In 1216, Colchester was attacked by King John because the castle was still occupied by a French force at that time. Once conquered, the castle would become the property of England and remain so throughout the Middle Ages. By the 13th century, the castle was used as a prison for prisoners of war, and then much of the castle would be in ruins by the 16th century. Still, it would be structurally intact enough to continue uh, vacillating back and forth between being a prison, uh, a private residence. While a prison, it was the site of frequent executions all the way until the end of the 17th century. All uh, an, un- an untold number of people were tortured and killed at this site during its prison and execution years. Colchester was a key landmark during the infamous Essex Witch Trials. During the 16th and 17th centuries alone, hundreds of suspected witches were imprisoned inside the castle. Many were tortured and killed. A pri- How dare they? <laughs> a pri- yeah. Oh my gosh, what a terrible time to be alive. A private individual purchased the castle at the end of the 17th century with the intention to demolish it. But in 1727, it was given as a wedding present to lawyer and antiquarian Charles Gray, who helped restore the castle. In the 1740s, Gray added a park around the castle that remains to this day. Colchester Castle then finally became a museum for archaeological treasures in 1860. And now the museum exhibits over 2,000 years of British history. With centuries of history stored within the castle walls, it seems almost inevitable that Colchester Castle would be haunted. There have been many unexplained encounters and reports of paranormal activity inside the castle, most of which comes from employees and security staff who work or have worked there after dark. The following stories come from the Colchester Museum's Ghost Stories page. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of Colchester Castle. Early one morning, a museum employee named Chris was opening up the Natural History Museum. He hadn't been to Colchester for several days. He was shutting off the alarm and noticed something strange. He heard a ticking. As he went to the front desk to inspect its source, the noise got louder and louder. He realized it was the sound of a clock. He wondered who had installed a clock he had never heard before. He didn't think the museum had one. Most employees and guests alike used their phones when they wanted to know the time. He continued to follow the sound, soon ended up at the back doors of the museum. Seemed like the ticking was coming from outside, so Chris unlocked the back door and peeked out. He still heard the clock ticking louder now, but still couldn't determine where it was coming from. He went outside, saw it was coming from a very unexpected place now, a group of nearby gravestones. Chris was starting to get a little freaked out. Still couldn't see any clock, but the ticking continued. Chris followed the sound of the gravestones where he found nothing out of place, no clocks, no other, uh, any other out of place objects, but one gravestone did catch his eye. And as soon as Chris stepped in front of it, the ticking stopped as if telling him that he had followed the sound of the correct location. The gravestone read, here lies the body of John Smorthwaite, renowned Colchester clockmaker. Loving husband and father died age 60. Another employee, Roy, decided to take an afternoon break one day when he had a paranormal experience. He asked two front desk staff at the Holly Trees Museum located in the parkland portion of the castle grounds owned by Colchester, uh, asked him if they wanted some tea. They did, so Roy put on a kettle, and a moment later he heard footsteps. When he turned around, he saw a man and a woman enter the room, his co-workers. But then moments later, another woman he did not recognize entered the room as well and exclaimed, Sorry I was slow, I was just locking up. She then turned and left, leaving Roy and his co-workers confused as to who she was. It was just the three of them working that shift. They looked but couldn't find that woman. They never saw her again and soon began to assume they had just had an odd run-in with a ghost. Here's another quick run-in. One visitor was walking through the Holly Trees Museum with his daughter. They entered a costume room, but didn't stay for long because his daughter became anxious and said she wanted to leave. When her father questioned her after exiting, she said, I didn't like that lady. He tried to reassure her that they were just mannequins, but she insisted, no, not them, the lady standing next to me. It had just been the two of them in the room. This next person encountered a spirit allegedly witnessed by many on the castle grounds. Museum employee Sarah was walking up the staircase in the center of the Holly Trees Museum and checking each room as she went to the top floor. She paused at the childhood gallery because she heard people talking inside. Being the dutiful employee she was, she decided to check in with the visitors in case she needed to explain anything to them. Sarah enjoyed speaking with the guests and thought that she could show them some more artifacts they might have missed. As she made her way through the room, the voice moved farther away rather than closer until eventually she was at the exit, hadn't seen anyone, but could still hear them. Back at the entrance of the gallery now. Sarah turned around, came to the entrance door. When she entered the room, she smelled lilac perfume, but all was silent. 
When Sarah then went into the offices on the top floor, she told a senior duty officer about what had just happened or about what just had about what just happened. And all he said was, ah, so you have finally met the white lady. I see the white lady is one of the more prominent paranormal figures to appear on the Colchester Museum property. She is reported to be the spirit of Anne Lissell, a local woman from the 1700s whose portrait hangs in the Holly Trees Museum. Many report feeling an eerie presence standing beside them when they look at her portrait. Anne Lissell's footsteps are often heard running past the gun room. She is often seen by young children and may be the source of the many reports of a woman's face peeking out of some of the windows at night. This next encounter also involves the white lady. A security guard named Dave was once patrolling the building before he locked up for the evening. He passed by the Georgian house, saw a light on upstairs. He stepped away to get a better look, now saw a young woman's face in the window. From what he could see, her clothes looked old, real old, as in a few centuries out of fashion. Dave did another loop to see if any doors or windows were open. He was a bit spooked. He was certain it wasn't a staff member he'd seen because they'd all left for the night. When he returned to the window, the light was now off and he couldn't see the face any longer. He checked the room. No one was inside. He told himself he'd imagined the whole thing and went home. The next day, he met with the Holly Tree security guard, uh, with one of them, explained what had happened, and the guard told him that he had seen Miss Lissell. Dave asked what she was doing working so late, to which the guard replied, why Miss Lissell has been dead almost 300 years. Now for a strange ghost-in-the-machine type of encounter. Late one Friday night, the museum was open uh, for a group of students playing an escape room game. Just two staff members were left behind to close up. They walked through the chapel to turn off all the lights, made their way to the Roman galleries. When they approached the spiral staircase leading downstairs, they heard a voice say, So you've come to take a look around, have you? They recognized the voice as the jailer, one of, the inter- one of their interactive sound displays in the prison. The jailer's monologue continued and the employees moved on and continued locking up. But before they headed out for the night, they decided to check the prison to make sure nothing was amiss. And when they re-entered this area where they had had that interaction, now the motion detector did not activate and the jailer's voice did not speak to them. Looking into why, the motion sensor was actually turned to face the wall, making it unable to detect movement. So how had it known to speak to them earlier? And then they found out that what they heard was not one of the jailer's pre-programmed interactions. Two more. Employee Sam was locking up the upper galleries one night, turning everything off. As she approached the Boudica gallery, she saw a shadow reflecting on the glass. It looked to be someone heading towards the staff-only area. She followed them, thinking it could be a visitor who was lost, looking for help. She called out, Hello, I'm afraid we're closed now. If you'd like to come with me, I can let you downstairs. Or let you out downstairs. Silence. Sam now saw something moving through another set of doors leading to the great staircase. Again, thinking it was a guest from the last tour who had been left behind or gotten lost, she went towards the gate, but was interrupted when a figure stepped out of the shadows and started limping towards her. Sam felt off and a little nervous. The figure was a person, kind of. It seemed to become blurrier the closer it got to the gate until it was, quote, engulfed in a thickening cloud of fog. And then before Sam screamed, the figure vanished. Oddly, a name entered her mind as it disappeared, as if the thought was placed there by an unseen entity. James Parnell. Like the white lady, James Parnell is another infamous paranormal figure said to haunt Colchester. James Parnell was a young 17th century Quaker who was arrested and tortured before dying inside the castle. He is also known as the Boy Martyr. In 1656, Parnell was arrested and imprisoned in Colchester Castle, arrested for blasphemy. He was fined 40 pounds but refused to pay, and when he refused to pay, was sent to Colchester. He died, painfully, on April 10, 1656, and ever since, James' spirit reportedly haunts the dungeon area. There are some reports that his cries of anguish can still be heard inside the castle. Last little entry for today. Numerous Colchester employees have reported hearing disembodied whispers and seeing faces in windows. A lot of spiritual activity seems to occur around closing time, when all is dark and quiet in the museum. At night, two other frequently spotted resident ghosts are a headless nun seen in the chapel, and a red lady who is suspected to be a daughter of a jailer. One former museum assistant named Alyssa heard stories from other assistants about this red lady suddenly appearing behind them in the mirror in the women's restroom. Numerous spirits from different periods of time seem to coexist on the grounds of Colchester Castle, and since they don't seem to hurt anyone, even if they frighten some, there are currently no plans to have the grounds cleansed to try and remove them. Yeah, I mean, why would you? They yeah. all seem harmless. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't work there, so what do I care? Right. Draw some extra visitors, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. 
Uh, I just have a few pictures. Uh, this first one is the restored Colchester Castle. So, I mean, you know, really historic, cool building. Oh, wow. And the beautiful park grounds that surround it. Oh, man. I know England has, I mean, just Europe in general. Yeah. So many cool, like, manors and old estates. Uh, this next one, a little spookier shot of the castle. Uh, you know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just uh, always looks a little uh, better for the show when it's like black and white or something. Dun, or night. Dun, dun. And then finally, just an old jail cell. Underneath the castle's darkest days where prisoners were shackled to the wall and kept there in the dark. Oh. Yikes, what a terrible fate to spend your last days in a place like that. You know, jails don't look much better nowadays. No, but you're I mean, not, not, but you're not shackled should. to the wall yeah, in general usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, maybe you should be. <laughs> Some people, some I know. people. Oh, some monsters. Mm -hmm. I liked that story. It was just nice. It was, it yeah. was, nice. It was a nice palate cleanser because the first my one mind, was so heavy. Uh, my mind is still there. And then I was picturing, you know, last summer mm. we were lucky enough to go hiking in Iceland, and mm. there are like out oh. in out in the middle of nowhere cabins, yeah. houses, farms. Like I just ha in my brain, I was there for so. I was like, oh my god, that would be so awful because. Yeah. It's so cold. It's so dark. Yep. Like, ay, ay, ay. The creepiest part, just give me a little bit of chills of that first story, is when um she wakes up after, you know, killing her husband, all the trauma, and then finally nods off and then wakes yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he's across the cabin marrying her position. I know. Ah! I know. I know. I know. Yeah. I wanted her to set the body on fire when she took it outside. I know it was mm. snowing, so it's like a very difficult task, whatever, yeah. but- I was like, man, you should just burn that thing. I don't know if it would make a difference. Oh, I don't yeah. know if it would like release him from I don't know. the the possession, but blah, blah, too much, too much. I'm going to be thinking about that for so long. It's a good one, Dan. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of creepy imagery. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like the little two, I didn't like the little duo by the children's graves either. Yeah. Like standing next to each other. With, the, with a very obvious possession kind of thing. Yeah. And the shadow mirroring like the kind of like this an reanimated dead person's movements. So much uh, nightmare fuel. Yeah. That was great. Really great. Really loved it. <laughs> it was, um, yeah. Really, Terrible. Really enjoyable. I mean, really. <sighs> uh, who's your Layla this week? Um, I still got a traditional one. Okay. How, mm -hmm. did, how does she smell? Not at all. Oh. But I could get another one. No, I could get another one. We recently got a new one and we like at a show, a gift mm -hmm. from a fan during a meet and greet and I brought it home and I opened the suitcase and I was like, hmm, it smells like gingerbread tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it just, it, it's so potent. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, taking into consideration some feedback oh, yes. from uh -huh. fans. Uh, uh, it we is- We do like feedback. Yeah. Help, no, help, we, help us make our show better. Absolutely. Like it's, as long as it's constructive. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't send an email just being an asshole for the sake of being an asshole. But when you send, we got- Recently, we've gotten enough emails yeah. that are like, hey, I don't like it when Lindsay sets up the story or has conversation with Dan before the story. We okay. prefer it after the story. So we're just going to dive right into this story and then we can chat about it and okay. then we'll dive into the next one and chat about it. So just an alert of like a little change. We'll do it like this for a couple of weeks and see if that feels yeah. good. And if there's any kickback, we can, you know, make some further adjustments. Cool. Adjustments. All right, Daniel boy, ready spaghetti? <laughs> I am. All right. Dear DJ Suckmaster and Queen of <laughs> Peeperton. I love it. <laughs> I discovered Scared to Death in the summer of 2020 mm. when I was stretched thinner than thin and feeling quite blue. Uh, yeah. I wanted to lose myself in a podcast and came across Scared to Death. Listening to these stories strangely gave me peace. And now, on to my story. <laughs> a few years after we were married, my husband and I bought our first home. It was a modest Cape Cod built in 1948 with two bedrooms downstairs. The entire upstairs was one large room spanning the entire length of the home. Knowing that we would likely have children someday, we made the upstairs our bedroom and left the downstairs for further family expansion. Like most Cape Cod style homes, the room upstairs had low walls that went into a slanted ceiling which followed the pitch of the roof. Both the walls and the ceiling had been finished with paneling at some point in the home's history. Along the walls, there were several small doors that opened into a space between the paneling and the outside wall, presumably designed as a storage space. The ceiling came to a point. However, there was a slight drop ceiling where, at two different spots, fluorescent lights had been installed, mm. each covered by a decorative plastic sheeting. The space between the drop ceiling and the actual apex of the roof was less than one foot. Okay. Okay? Yep, yep. All right. Tiny space. Mm-hmm. When you move into any new space, it's natural to be hyper aware of new noises and sounds, especially in an old house. 
I grew up in an old farmhouse that made lots of noises through pipes, ducts, and wooden floors, so I was used to the symphony of natural noises that houses can produce. However, I'm also a lifelong creeper and very much believe that ghosts could be around any corner. My husband and I often joke that Grace, the home's original owner and whom our street was named for, was still hanging around. Even so, we never really thought that the house was actually haunted. At least not at first. About two years into living there, we were laying in bed one night and heard footsteps on the drop ceiling above our bed. Keep in mind that the space between the drop ceiling and the actual peak of the roof was less than one foot. Mm -hmm. Without speaking, my husband and I both paused what we were doing, listened as the footsteps went down the length of the entire room, only stopping as they passed over the two light fixtures in the ceiling. As quickly as it started, it stopped. We were puzzled but figured it was just some old house noise. Several nights later, we heard the footsteps again, and just like last time, they moved down the length of the ceiling, pausing briefly as they moved over the light fixtures. This time, we went into full debunk mode and started investigating. (laughs) We lifted the plastic cover to the light fixtures so we could peer into the small cavity above the drop ceiling. Even though what we had heard was definitely more of a footstep versus a scurry, we were looking for a mouse, a squirrel, a bat, any kind of critter. Nothing. We looked around the cavity for any pipes or ducts that could make noise when water or air passed through, but there was nothing like that present. We even looked in the side storage space on both sides of the walls, and again, nothing. The next time we heard the footsteps, my husband ran outside to look at the roof while I stayed in the bedroom to monitor the sounds. We didn't truly expect to find someone walking on the roof because the pitch of the roof was way too steep, but we wanted to see if there were any critters on the outside of the roof. And yet again, nothing. While I was hearing the the footsteps inside, my husband was outside to verify that there was nothing on the roof. Time passed and the footsteps continued. Always the same cadence, always stopping at the light fixtures. Sometimes they would occur day after day, Other times, weeks would go by between episodes, and at times they would occur when we were awake. Other times, the footsteps would wake us up in the middle of the night. Frankly, we got so used to hearing the footsteps that we didn't even find them too concerning at this point. Heard them again last night, one of us would say to the other in the morning. We knew there was no physical way an actual person could be walking on our ceiling, and we weren't being threatened in any way. As a lifelong creeper, I just assumed that there was some residual energy in the home. But then, one morning, my husband woke up and said, did you see that little boy last night? I told him no. I had Mm -hmm. no idea what he was talking about. He went on to say that he had woken up in the middle of the night, turned over to find the apparition of a young boy standing next to our bed. The boy, about four or five years of age, looked at him almost with a mischievous look. And then shortly after my my husband saw him, he simply faded away. He never saw him again, nor did I. However, a few weeks later, we were looking at the end of our bed and saw a small handprint on the wall. When we moved in, we had painted our walls with two different shades of purple, almost in a sponge-like pattern. The walls had been painted for several years at this point, and we had never noticed this shape before. It seemed to have just appeared. We thought it was possible that one of us had touched the wall and the oil from our hand had left a mark, so we took a rag and cleaned the spot quite well. But that wasn't it. The shape of a small child's handprint remained clearly in the paint, not on the surface. While it was strange, we still weren't really that concerned. The energy of the house was very positive, and we were at peace with these unexplainable happenings. Shortly after the sighting of the little boy and the emergence of the handprint, we found out we were pregnant with our first child. We still occasionally heard the footsteps, but we were preoccupied with preparations for our new family and, quite frankly, tired. A few months after our son was born, it occurred to both of us that the footsteps had completely stopped. We lived in that house for another 14 years and never heard the footsteps again. The handprint, however, remained on the wall, a reminder of our whole experience. Was our newborn son too noisy for our friendly ghost, disturbing its peace and encouraging it to move on? Did our sixth sense weaken when we became parents too tired and busy with raising, raising children that we were no longer attuned to the psychic world? I've also wondered if our son, who has proven to be very high energy and occasionally impatient, was waiting in the wings, trying to get our attention before he made his entrance in the world. Was it his spirit Mm -hmm. waiting for the right time to join us in a physical body? Or was it Grace, the home's original owner, just letting us know she was still around, 
roaming the street named after her. <laughs> yeah, I like that story. Yeah, it's kind of sweet. Uh, when you set up the... Um, <laughs> I was trying not to laugh for a little while in the beginning when you described that tiny little like above the lights, like like between the apex of the roof mm-hmm. and the the top of that fluorescent light, less than a foot, like uh-huh. this, this tiny little wedge. Yeah. And then I was picturing like footsteps. Tiny, I was picturing the tiniest the little boy. The tiniest ghost. <laughs> I was picturing like an eight inch tall ghost <laughs> up there with like heavy footed to make the footsteps, but so teeny tiny. Well, now I'm picturing him being like all legs, like just like, like, one fourth of an inch of a torso <laughs> and then just these like super long in comparison legs mm-hmm. with these giant like Zach Flannery boots on them. Like like a little boom, tiny boom, He-Man, boom. He-Man action figure oh but God. with like giant clown feet. <laughs> just like the physics don't even work. I like the idea that the person who sent in this story poses the question of whether or not our spirits exist before, like before our, our bodies, bodies exist. Because mm-hmm. that is something that that is a belief a lot of people have. A lot of people believe it that like, mm-hmm. you know, it's just waiting for the right moment to jump into the right body yeah. to join the right family, the right wrinkle in time. Like yeah. this is your moment. Mm-hmm. I love that. It's mm-hmm. actually too. very sweet. But yeah, interesting that the story, the, that the story, that the footsteps never came back. Right. 14 years. After the birth of their boy. And they lived there for two years before they ever even heard anything. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Just that short little window. Yeah, yeah. I think like, I would presume that in moving into a house, I'd be nervous about hearing something for the first like six months or so. But then yeah. if I didn't hear or see anything, I'd think like, oh, okay, this this place is fine. Yeah. And I would relax. And maybe that's what they're waiting for. <laughs> and to sweep in when you least expect it. Uh-huh. Yeah. But it didn't torment them or anything though? Just, nope. just a couple one siding yeah. and strange noises for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty pretty innocent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. You ready for one more? I am. Okay. Well, we have another little boy. Okay. This boy's in the attic. <laughs> To the Lord and Lady of Spoopy Tales. I'm a borderline creep, so I find all the stories to be equally fascinating fascinating, mm-hmm. and also a bit terrifying. That being said, I have a tale that is simultaneously wild, cool, and interesting. <laughs> Growing up, I enjoyed all things creepy. My best friend and I spent hours watching every horror movie we could find. This was the 80s and the 90s, so of course these movies were peak cinema. We also enjoyed scaring each other with stories from scary stories to tell in the dark and going on obligatory ghost hunts. I was convinced something was haunting my closet and we even set up a ghost trap using the fail-proof method of flour all over the floor. When there were no footprints in the flour the next morning, I took that as irrefutable evidence that there was definitely a ghost lurking about. My parents took it as evidence that I really wanted to spend the day cleaning and maybe that I was not as bright as they previously believed. (laughs) I also once came upstairs from our basement screaming to my mom that I had seen a coffin in my bedroom down there. A child's imagination or a ghostly mirage? Or maybe my parents were secretly shopping at Casco and storing their wares in Ah, my room. I forgot about Casco. The real scare started when I was in my mid-30s, however. My husband, daughter, and I moved into our first house together while I was seven months pregnant with my second daughter. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. (laughs) The first thing we noticed after moving in was a strange walled-off section in the attic with a small door that looked as if it were a makeshift bedroom. Now, the attic is large and would actually make a really fun room if it was finished and better insulated. As it was, there were exposed beams and giant nails sticking out, and it's generally frigid in the winter, blazing hot in the summer. But that was just one of the things that made this room within the attic pretty sketchy. What added to the creep factor was the children's airplane wallpaper, small metal metal bed frame, and wooden dresser in the room. When we moved into the house, the house was completely cleaned out with the exception of this room. Who would put a small child in an attic? We immediately got rid of the bed and the dresser, but the little room with its airplane wallpaper is still there because we just haven't gotten around to renovating that part of the house. Not long after we moved in, I had my second child and life went on in that hazy, sleep-deprived, newborn stage kind of way. That's why at first, I thought it was just my tired brain playing tricks on me when I would occasionally hear my oldest daughter or husband calling out my name only to have them tell me they hadn't said a word. However, as my youngest grew older and the phantom voices continued, I knew it was something else. I would be in the kitchen making dinner or in the basement doing laundry, and I swear I'd hear, Mommy, in my daughter's voice, 
coming from upstairs. I would go to see her to see what she wanted, and she would tell me she had never called out for me at all. At other times, it would be my husband's voice, but it was always the same thing. He had never called for me. One night, while my daughters were staying over at my parents, I was in the shower while waiting for my husband to get home from work. I was just about finished when I distinctly heard the sound of him clearing his throat. As a smoker, it's a sound he makes often, and it often drives me crazy. I called out, asking why he was home early, but he never responded. When I got out of the shower and looked for him, he was nowhere to be found. Needless to say, when he did finally come home two hours later, I was freaked out. We definitely had something in the house, and it was mimicking my loved ones. There were a few other odd incidents here and there over the years. The light in my living room randomly turned off while I was home alone, and when I politely asked for whomever had turned it off to turn it back on, it did. Fun things like that. But the creepiest thing that really kicked up again was when my youngest daughter was about three. That's when she began telling me about the little boy who lived in the attic and how he would come down at night and sit on her bed and visit her. Her bedroom did have a door to the attic in it, but she had never been up there because she was only three, it was only used for storage, and we always kept it locked. She was unaware of the creepy room because it just wasn't something we talked about anymore. It was old news to us by now. The little boy in the attic stories went on for a few months. She would tell me little details about him and even blamed him for eating her Easter candy when I found wrappers in her room. To be fair, that may have just been a toddler sneaking some chocolate and not wanting to get in trouble. Then, as soon as she started talking about him, she stopped. When I would occasionally ask about him, she would get very serious, tell me that he wasn't real, and then refuse to say anything else. However, about a year later, She came to me with a picture she had drawn of our family. It included four people, two animals, and a person in the attic. (laughs) When I asked her to tell me about it, she said it was a picture of her, her sissy, me, her dad, our dog, and our cat. I asked about the person she drew at the top of the page, and she matter-of-factly stated, that's the boy in the attic. When I asked her if she had seen him lately, she ignored the question and went about her day as if she hadn't just given me the world's creepiest drawing. Kids are so fun like that. Lost items began to reappear in my house. My youngest daughter had been playing dress up at her grandparents' house with some of her grandmother's jewelry. When she left for the day, my mom was unable to find two rings my daughter had been playing with. One of them had sentimental value as it had belonged to her sister who had passed away when she was just a teenager. When I tell you we searched for those rings, we searched. Her house, my house, tore them apart. Couldn't find them. While my mom was disappointed, we realized there was the possibility that these things would never be found again. And after all, they were just things. So we stopped looking. A year later, I went to the basement to do laundry. And there was my mom's sister's ring sitting on my dryer like it had been there the whole time. Of course, I thought maybe my husband or one of the kids had happened to find it somewhere down there and had forgotten to tell me. But they all said they hadn't. And they would have told me right away if they had, since they knew we'd been searching for it. Two weeks later, the second ring appeared in the same spot. I was creeped out, but then started to wonder if I should be thanking this thing instead of being afraid of it. Turns out I should be thankful because here's the craziest part of this entire saga. When I was 10, my parents bought me a tiny pair of diamond earrings for my birthday. They weren't terribly expensive, but they were real and they were mine and I Mm. cherished them. And that's why I was absolutely crushed when I discovered one day I had lost one. We looked absolutely everywhere, but just a tiny earring was lost, so our chances of finding it were slim at best. Of course, we never did find it, and as always, life went on. Fast forward, November 1st, 2021. I was getting ready for the day and opened my jewelry armoire to find some earrings. I noticed a small diamond earring sitting separately from all the rest. I had held onto that one and I hadn't that I hadn't lost all these years because it was still sentimental to me. At first, I assumed it was just that one I had kept, but it was odd since I normally sorted with all the others. When I looked through the pile, I found the other earring. Upon further examination, the one that was separated from the others, I could see that the back of the earring had a small crack in it, which would explain how I had lost it all those years ago. Here's the thing. I know most people are thinking that I had likely had it all along, mm-hmm. and I just didn't notice it. But a few things to note to dispel this notion. The armoire I have, I currently received as a gift when I was in my 20s. I did not have this as a child when I lost the earring. 
I'm also very meticulous, a type A person mm -hmm. who thoroughly organizes and maintains everything. You can believe that when I first received the armoire that I did not haphazardly throw in my jewelry. Instead, I went through all of it to check for broken items that needed to be tossed or earrings that were missing their mates, except for the diamond, of course. Furthermore, because I'm a crazy neurotic person, I have gone through that jewelry box several times over the years to clean it out and donate unwanted items. I would have seen that second earring at some point throughout the years, but it was never there until that crazy day in 2021. And it still blows my mind. Wow. That earring, I, I, like, I like that they broke down like, you know, the timeline with the earring and the armoire and everything. Yeah. Because that's an especially weird detail. I mean, weird that like items would go missing for a year or more in the house that were lost in the house and then reappeared in the house. Well, okay. First of all, those rings were lost at the grandmother's house, not even at their house. Oh, I, I didn't put that together. I, I thought the earring was the aberration that way where it was lost in a different location and now shows up in this location. So multiple things were lost in other locations and now show up at this location. Yeah. And I, I and show up in, and show up in the house with the boy in the attic. That's right. So like, I guess like, uh, I guess, I mean, just you know, playing with possibilities in the paranormal world. Like this spirit can just go anywhere. It's just so weird. We're like, how the hell would it know uh -huh. where these things were lost? Well, and, uh, do my my thought yeah. on the, the rings and the boy in the attic is that, and, and then ultimately the earring is, okay, I think the little boy is attached to the daughter. And so the daughter goes to the grandparents' house to play. And I think the mm -hmm. little boy is theoretically with her and she's uh -huh. playing dress up. And when the two rings go missing, like any parent or yeah. grandparent or yeah. adult, you think that the, oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, child yeah. like shoved them in their pocket and went yeah. home with them, not to steal them, but just like, you know, yeah. because kids are thoughtless. And then when, when they search both houses and it couldn't be fine, be found, it's right. like, okay, well they're just gone forever. Yeah. Well, the little boy, if he was playing with the little girl, I think he had them. He held on to them. And then when he saw like the distress about it. Right. Like all kids, he wants approval and love and acceptance. So he puts the one ring out. Everyone's elated that it's found. Yeah. He sees that. So then he's mm -hmm. like, well, here's the other one. And then it's kind of like, what other good deeds can I do to make these people love me? Like, I know that sounds kind of far-fetched. So maybe the earring was lost many years ago at the grandma's house as well. And then like, uh, I don't know how long the grandma lived in that house. Right. I kind of thought that too. Like, oh, maybe that's where she lost it all along. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. That can make like sense, you know, like with that logic. Yeah. And uh, and then at first, you know, like when the person was like uh, the storyteller talking about like, why would they put this little boy's room in the attic? I do kind of get it where it's like, okay, not thinking about attics being haunted, sure. but best utilization of space. Mm -hmm. I get it as a parent where you like to have your kids above you so you can hear what they're up to. Sure do. And also, if you're like an attic has a, if, if, if there's likely like a pitched roof, yeah. which is, I mean, what I always think of with attics. Yeah a littler person mm -hmm. isn't going to be uh, hindered by that as much as a bigger person. Exactly, exactly. And it was- Because it can sound spooky at first, but if, like, if you break it down, it's like, it makes sense. Yeah, like I think about, when people say like living in an attic, mm -hmm. I think about my cousin and her husband. They lived in this house in Parma and it like had a main floor with like a bedroom, a bathroom, a bedroom, front room kitchen had a yeah. basement but then it also like when you came in their side door mm -hmm. you could go down to the basement you could go up like three steps and find yourself in the kitchen or you could like how would you do that you would come through the kitchen that's what it was you'd come through the kitchen and go up another flight of stairs and it was an attic yeah but it was just like a a like someone had repurposed this like upstairs space it had a very it didn't have like weird steps it was a very normal set of stairs and you got up there and the roof wasn't pitched like this it was like this and it had like a flat spot in the middle almost like a uh, like a farmhouse i guess you could yeah, mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there were there was a playroom up there there was yeah. another bedroom and i think as their kids got older it became the kids bedrooms cuz it was like yeah out of the way, the kids could be kind of loud up there without disrupting everyone. So it wasn't this like creepy, you know, like uh, insulation hanging yeah. down. It's like, no, it had wallpaper, it had finished walls, it had closets. It was just a different way to utilize space. Right. Almost felt like an addition. Yeah, the roof on that house you're describing is like, it's pitched on the sides of the house, but then breaks off into a flat plane on the top, right? I wish I could, like, what is that called? Is that like an... Quaker farmhouse? I don't know. I'm a terrible artist, but I'm just going to say it's like this. Oh, good. Yes. I'm not going to show you that. Oh. It's like, is, is it I, like, I can't like draw like 3D, but it's like, these are the sides. And instead of it coming together like yeah, this, it goes like this. And there's this. a flat spot here. Yeah. It goes like this. Yeah. Yeah. I can picture what you're talking about. I want to say the Amityville house is, 
Oh, maybe not. I don't know. But anyway, I have picture. I can picture various haunted houses over the years. My mind goes to the Midwest for some reason. It doesn't matter. I know well, for people listening. I think, <laughs> like, did who cares? she say? But, is it this story that it's the um, the Cape Cod house, or is that the mm. first story? Oh, that was the first story. Okay, the no, because I was like, oh, yeah. maybe that's what a Cape Cod is. Is when it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost like octagonal, yeah. if you right, will. Right, right. No, I know. Nah. I, can, I can picture exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I just don't know the name of it. I think it is like more of a Midwest East Coast thing. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any yeah, I don't see them out houses. Here. I don't see them out here like this. Yeah. But I know I've seen houses like that in Ohio, Pennsylvania, places like that. Ohio, that's all that matters. <laughs> um, okay. Well, good, good fan stories. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. How did you feel about just diving right into them? Was that easier? Yeah, I like it. You know, I do get it for horror where it's like, I like it because um, the element of surprise. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, letting people know a little bit about what they're getting, getting yeah. into. Yeah. I find that, um, I think about that with trailers for horror movies. Oh, yeah. When they give the whole thing. It's yeah. like, why am I even going to see this movie? And that's changed in recent years where I'm like, I'm afraid to watch trailers now. Yeah. Where, where I, maybe it's always been that way and it's just in my mind. But I feel like they used to share less details. Like you would get the general sense of what this movie was about without giving away a ton of key moments. I know. But I've watched trailers now where I'm like, you just fucking ruined like <gasps> three or four of the best moments in the movie for me. Wait, I'm laughing because re recently we were on a plane and it was a yeah. trailer for what looked like the dumbest fucking movie ever. Like so stupid. It's like yeah. some girl, she's in like Italy. Oh yes. And it went, you oh guys, my God, it was the longest trailer I've ever. It's like, I'm telling you like an abridged version of the entire movie. If, if it was a 90 minute movie, it was a 10 minute trailer. <laughs> and I'm like, I oh, like it. Yeah. Like I know everything that happens. She, huh? she goes to this other country. Yeah, yeah, she meets the whole a boy. Arc. She's in, she plays music. Yep, it she, was, she sat at first. She's bummed out. She's having trouble. And we, we can't even hear it. We're just looking at the <laughs> visuals. And then she meets this boy and then they have a relationship and it's going great oh for a long time. God. And then they have turmoil and then things turn to sour but then somehow it all comes back around at the end i'm like what the fuck why would you just show all of that in why? one trailer yeah and also looked like a terrible terrible movie yeah it's so dumb mm -hmm. yeah the, yeah we, we saw enough of the trailer to know that we never want to watch the movie yep like a bunch of like c-list like trying to like come up actors uh, My i don't God, know so bad uh do you want to do some uh, annabelle shout outs okie dokie artichokey I would like to thank the following Annabelles for their support on Patreon. And just as a reminder for our patrons or for anybody who's listening who mm -hmm. is like new to the show, if you join the Patreon, uh, there are two different levels. There's uh, the Roberts and the Annabelles. The Annabelles, you get a merch discount. You get um, your name shouted out on the show. You get yeah. to know that uh, from both tiers that we take uh, a percentage of all Patreon across both shows donated to charities. That's how we get this money. So if you're yeah. new. 20%. 20%. Uh, and then of that 20%, we take 10% and we slosh it away for the scholarship fund so that each year it's growing. Like this year, we're doing three $5,000 scholarships. Yeah. But anyways, there's like a lot of like bonus content over there. So if you're curious, you can go to patreon.com, look for Scared to Death, and then you can see what's available. It is really fun. We love it. You get, I don't know, mer special merch. There's all kinds of fun things over there. So just in mm. case you're new, it's been a while since we've talked yeah, about yeah, it. Totally. Uh, we love you whether you can or cannot support us. We're happy you're here. All right. Annabelle shout outs. This is where you get your name. <laughs> We'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Karen and Jody, Amber D, Kelsey, Tanya Welch. This is my favorite name. Okay. Summer Ireland. I don't know who Ooh. you are, but I fucking love you. Mm -hmm. I, you are like effervescent in my mind. You're ethereal. Mm. Cammie Alexander, Bone Daddy Smalls, Daniel, <laughs> I hear Tyler laughing. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Lanares, Alexa Hill, and Ashley Baldwin. Perfect. And I will thank the following Annabelles TJ Tiny B, <laughs> uh, Casey McConnell, Katie Wellman, James Moore, Christina Cole, Ashley Topperween Brendeski. There's a hyphenated. So it's like top, Topperwine or Topperween. It's W E I N, probably wine. Is it T U or T O? T O E. P P E R W E I N. Toper? Toper. Toperveen. Toperveen. Maybe. Oh, it's like German. Toperveen Brandeski. I liked Topper Wiener Brand Brandy. Uh, <laughs> Ashley, Ashley Top Wiener. Ashley Top Wiener Brandy, you're a fine girl. What a good life you would be. Oh, man. That would, uh, is anybody watching Better Call Saul? <laughs> uh, Yoma Rodriguez, Amber uh, Chari, Hunter Clements, and Josh Ward. So here's the thing too. If you're an Annabelle, you get to listen to us attempt to say your name, mm -hmm. uh, properly pick on your name. And mm -hmm. also sometimes we even like to do like weird matchmaking between names. Mm -hmm. We've created law firms. We've yeah. created like... 
<laughs> it's super fun. All right. And then the following spoopy shout outs of some cute ones this week. So just really quick, uh, when you're talking about pairings, yeah. I picture the weird pairing of Summer Ireland and TJ Tiny B. <laughs> no, it should be Daddy Smallbones. Daddy, he- <laughs> Daddy, <laughs> Daddy Bone Smalls. Uh, wait, Bone Daddy Smalls. Bone Daddy Smalls hooking up with Summer Ireland. No. No? No, Bone Daddy Smalls and... And TJ Tiny B. I was thinking of an odd pairing though. Like oh. you wouldn't expect it. I like the weird. I like. I like. All, I like so many words together. Okay. okay. Is Bone Daddy Smalls just like a bunch of hip hop names. Bone, I don't th- know. Bone, Bone Thugs Bone and Daddy. Harmony, Biggie Smalls, and what was Bone Daddy and and Puff Daddy? Puff Daddy. Daddy. <gasps> Maybe I don't know. Bone Daddy. Can you tell us where that came from? <laughs> we I'm, would like I, to know. For some reason, I'm picturing a very skinny, short bit version of Biggie Smalls. Oh my God, that'd be fantastic. Bone Daddy Smalls. <laughs> bone Daddy Smalls. Mm-hmm. Like 5'1", maybe 95 pounds. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Little, little Bone Daddy. <laughs> but he got a lot of swag. Now now I'm singing in my head that stupid song that Monroe sang, Skeleton Bones. Oh my God, yeah. She was the cutest. Oh my <laughs> God. Okay, spooby shout outs. To Matt from Jessica, happy anniversary. I, I can't speak. Mm-hmm. To Matt from Jessica. Yeah. Happy anniversary. And. I love celebrating life with you. Nailed it. Got it. To Shelby from Zoe, happy birthday. Your San Diego family adores you. Inside joke here. Upside down keyboard forever. <laughs> Who knows? I love a good inside joke. To Evelyn, aka Evelyn, and Oliver from your mom, Kelsey. I love listening to Scared to Death with the two of you. To Becky and Taylor from Taylor. This is awesome. Happy birthday to us. Two sisters born on the same exact day, two years apart. Oh, wow. Yep. Cool. Not yeah. even Irish twins. Just like, mm-hmm. what a funny thing. This is great. To Muddy River Water Eyes from Vomit in the Middle of the Ocean Eyes. Okay. I love you. You're the best wife I could ever ask for. You can achieve anything you set your mind to. And to Lenora from Kevin, <laughs> happy birthday, baby. You're so loved. Vomit in the Middle of the Ocean. How did that eyes. come up? Yeah. I, no, I'm thinking eyes. I'm just like, God, your eyes. They just, God, it's like, it's like staring at vomit in the middle of the ocean. So maybe they have really <laughs> super brown eyes. Or maybe they have hazel eyes, actually. Mm. That would be more accurate. And that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith and Tyler C. for their work on social media with Ryan Handelsman and his team and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com and to Tyler again for producing and directing today. Thanks to Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, our book editor, Drew Atana. Thanks for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. I found the first story I told this week. Thanks to Olivia Lee for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and to see pictures that accompany each episode at Scared to Death Podcast. We have a, we have a TikTok handle at Scared to Death Podcast as well with show highlights. And a private Facebook group called Creeps and Peepers, where you can meet so many horror lovers. Uh, if you don't want to hear any ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and so much more. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. And Magic Productions. picturing the tiniest the little boy. The tiniest ghost. <laughs> I was picturing like an eight inch tall ghost <laughs> up there with like heavy footed to make the footsteps, but so teeny tiny. <laughs>